motion adopted by the committee on Monday, 24, April 24, 2023. The committee resumes its study of the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation. I'd now like to welcome our witness joining us by video conference, Mr. Mel Cap, as a professor. It's, it's, uh, we, we've never met, sir, but it's, it's, it's nice to see you and thank you for joining us today. Mr. Cap, I understand you have a, an opening statement. You have the floor for five minutes. Over to you, please. Unmute, Mr. Cap. You know, the most oft stated uh, words since COVID have been, you have to unmute. Um, thank you. Uh, merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I worked within the public service for over 30 years. Sub Deputy Minister by Prime Minister Mulroney and then served as Clerk of the Privy Council to Prime Minister Chrétien. And I continued to serve as High Commissioner to the United Kingdom in the first government of Prime Minister Stephen Harper. I am now actually not a professor, uh, although uh, my students call me that. I am uh, titled a Distinguished Fellow at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto. And from 2016 to 2018, perhaps relevant to this uh, hearing, I was a mentor for the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation. I originally declined to accept the committee's invitation to appear in committee on the matter of the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation because I felt I had nothing to contribute to the committee's study of the matter. When the committee requested a second time, I agreed to appear. However, I do not want to disappoint the committee. I still believe I have really nothing to contribute to the committee's understanding of the issue. Comment. Just the same, I was the Clerk of the Privy Council from January 1999 till June 2002, during the period where the Foundation was created. Uh, Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau passed away in September of 2000. I was indeed Clerk, and as the government considered how to commemorate former Prime Minister Trudeau, I postponed Cabinet consideration to allow for the preparation of alternatives and a more structured and disciplined deliberation of the means of honoring the deceased former PM. After that, I believe that the Industry Department, Canadian Heritage, and the Treasury Board of Secretariat would have worked on proposals. To the best of my recollection, I had no further involvement in the creation of the foundation or the government's relations with it. I was preoccupied with the preparation for a transition of government with a pending election then the implementation of the new government's agenda, and then, most unfortunately, the closed border with the United States and everyone else, the closed airspace, after 9-11, and the decision to send troops to Afghanistan. I was involved with the preparation of the budget and the speech of the throne. As far as I can recall, I had no further consideration of the Trudeau Foundation. On February 20th, 2002, the then Minister of Industry, Alan Rock, announced in the House the creation of the scholarship program under the aegis of the P. Trudeau Foundation. I left Ottawa in June of that year, of 2002. Apparently, I'm told, the government ultimately signed a contribution agreement with the foundation in May of 2004. And by that time, I'd been in London as High Commissioner for two years. Now, in addition, from 2016 to 2018, I was a mentor for two PhD students who were fellows of the foundation. One was a pediatric oncologist at SickKids Hospital in Toronto, working on a PhD in public health at McMaster University. And the other was a student from Oshawa working on his PhD at Oxford University in public health in West Africa. He now has his PhD and is a departmental lecturer at Oxford University. And he recently told me he hopes to find an academic position in Canada in the next year or two. These two young men of extraordinary talent and promise were typical of the fellows I met at the foundation. They give me great hope for the future of Canada. I've now told you pretty much everything I know about the Trudeau Foundation but I'm happy to answer questions about the foundation if I know anything about it that might help you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Mr. Cap. And I have to say, yes, I've been a fellow, never a distinguished fellow. So I, I, uh, I, I appreciate that, uh, that uh, uh, 
correction from from your side as well to make sure we get we get your uh, we get your title correct. And look, and and I appreciate what what you had to say, and uh, all all we ask is that you uh, you attempt to answer our, our questions as straightforward as you as you possibly can, um, and uh, we'll take it from there. So bells will go. I'm going to try to get through at least the first round uh, prior to voting. So m there might be a pause. Uh, uh, Mr. Cap, and then we'll 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 resume things uh, after votes. I, I I think you know the the system here. We sometimes have these speed bumps during committee, but we will proceed as best we can. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to um, open things up with the uh, with the conservative side. I'll start with uh, um, Mr. McCauley. You have the floor for six minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Cap. Thanks for joining us today, and I, I appreciate your opening statements and your comments about uh, perhaps uh, some difficulty in answering. But I certainly appreciate uh, what you can offer on your extensive experience. Um, just curious, like, the foundation falls under the Accountability Act. I'm just wondering if you have thoughts on what would have changed for obligations they might have pre and post and that. And what um, kind of the, the government structure, were you involved in any way or had any feedback or learned anything about the, the governance uh, process with the, the, the foundation? Um, so I'm going to speak um, for what I know, but it, uh, I'm not the authority on this. But my understanding, and I did see um, Mr. Nubley's uh, testimony before the committee earlier in the week. And I would just add a precision to, to the way he characterized the status of the foundation. He said that it was within the portfolio of the uh, industry department. Actually, it's um, incorporated under the Not-for-Profit uh, Corporations Act. And my understanding is that it actually is not subject to the Accountability Act. What it is subject to is a contribution agreement between the Department of Industry and the foundation. Um, but beyond that, I, I really don't know much more about it. And uh, when I was at the foundation, I um, I did participate in a couple of uh, events, um, meetings that we had with fellows and with mentors, um, one of which was in St. John's. And then we flew up to, uh, uh, well, Happy Valley Goose Bay and then on to Rigolette uh, in a remote part of uh, Labrador. And... Um, it uh, uh, at at that time, uh, my understanding was that the members of the of the corporation e elected the uh, outside uh, board members. That's really all I know. Yeah. They actually are covered under the Accountability Act, and oddly enough, they're uh, subject to uh, access to information requests. When you were uh, as a mentor, Didn't did you know. were you a mentor at all at the same time as? Um, Stephen Kakfui? Um, I believe I, I had known Mr. Kakfui before when he was premier of the uh, NWT. Um, I I think uh, he was at the uh, St. John's meeting I mentioned. Okay. Are you aware of the um, the uh, sexual harassment suit against uh, the foundation? Involving Only from what him? I heard you. Yeah. Only I, what I heard you raise at the committee. I'm, I'm not aware of anything more. Let, let me ask you, you mentioned you were a mentor to two students, and I think it's phenomenal. Um, are you aware of the rather um, over-the-top um, paperwork involved, including um, contracts? I understand it's a 60-page agreement that students have to sign, giving up a fair amount of their rights. I, I don't know. I, I looked for the contribution agreement between the government and the uh, foundation online, and I came across that, uh, ag rather, the agreement between the foundation and the students. Uh, but I, other than that, I don't know anything about it. So you're not aware of uh, the two students you mentored having to uh, sign such forms? I know they had to sign uh, uh, something. I, I don't know what it was. Yeah. Apparently, it's about a 60-page agreement that limits a lot of their rights um, for protection under such issues and also to perhaps uh, to speak out or um, hold the foundation uh, legally accountable and liable for any, any actions they take. I'm curious, like, if you look at, say, the, the Trudeau Foundation as it's set up, based on your experience, your rather extensive experience, how would be, 
there's a fair amount of taxpayers' money, $125 million, which is about $206 million in today's dollars. So getting up there, how, do you, how would you propose that parliamentarians would hold perhaps the board accountable for that money, their actions? And the reason I ask that, I look at the scandal with Hockey Canada, which is not a government organization but receives government money, the same with Gymnastics Canada. And I see parallels in a way between the actions of the two taxpayers funded. How would you think, in your experience, um, parliamentarians should hold them accountable for that money? Um, so with all due respect, sir, I, I think you should hold the government to account, first of all, uh, but that the contribution agreement uh, which was signed between the government and the uh, foundation should be the means by which they're held to account. Um, it's a subtlety and it's a small point, but it's not an insignificant one. Uh, my my only failing is I spent too much of my career in the Treasury Board Secretariat uh, and spent a lot of time uh, worrying about exactly these issues given that the federal government uh, was giving uh, so many grants and contributions, whether it was in sports, as you noted, or uh, uh, in the case of scholarships, uh, we need to have a way of, uh, or the government needs a way of holding them to account, and parliament needs a way of holding the government to account. Concerned about that is never a failing, sir, so thank you for your concern. I will agree with you there. Now, we've heard... Uh, very briefly, Mr. Collier, you're actually out of time. You know, so I'll, I'll, I'll save yeah. it for the next round. We'll Thanks, come back. Mr. Cap. Mr. Fragascatus, you have the floor for six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you to uh, Professor Cap for being here. Uh, sir, uh, you have uh, added to the record now uh, in terms of experiences working with graduate students uh, at the Trudeau Foundation or through the Trudeau Foundation, I should say. Uh, could you uh, elaborate a little more on on the experiences that you have had and where they have led in terms of the interactions with students who sound to be uh, doing quite well and uh, and have uh, turned into a success. Uh, what, what has that meant uh, to to you personally? Um, <laughs> that, uh, it was a wonderful experience. These two young men, uh, and, and frankly, I think uh, most of the fellows were women. I just happened to have two young men as mentees. Um, they uh, they're going to set the world on fire, and uh, they uh, have all this uh, talent, um, which uh, the foundation actually helps develop. Uh, the young chap I mentioned, who's teaching at uh, Oxford, uh, sent me a note recently where he said, "I would never have finished my doctorate if not for the financial support, professional network, and social and intellectual camaraderie." that I was lucky enough to receive as a scholar. He, he went on with a, a tug at his forelocks to me saying the mentorship aspect of the program was good too. But frankly, um, I would be happy to work for either of these two gentlemen. Mm -hmm. No, I think it's a very good thing when you have, uh, as anyone who's uh, been to graduate school and, and knows that it, uh, it does, uh, it's a challenge, and uh, certainly it's helped along when you do have mentors that uh, that provide assistance of the kind that you've provided. So that, I think that's a, a great contribution that you were able to make. Uh, I, I think that the, uh, and you'll forgive me for asking the, the question, but it does have to be asked. It's been asked of others who've appeared at committee recently uh, on this issue, but let's, um, let's confirm it. Um, in your interactions with uh, with students, in your interactions with uh, other colleagues at the Trudeau Foundation, was there ever an um, an effort made, um, an obligation put forward that um, the students had to uh, live up to a certain ideological predisposition or anything along these lines? Um, was it uh, an open? Uh, attitude that was taken with respect to choosing the students that would be mentored or did they have to be liberals did they have to be on the center left of the spectrum anything along these lines um uh, yeah you the way you asked the question i'm tempted to joke but this is not a joking matter so i won't um i uh no there was no understanding or incentive or pressure 
for students to, for the for scholars to be uh, of any uh, particular background. There were several of them that I met uh, who I thought uh, were uh, too far to one side or too far to the other. And in fact, I should say, and too far to the other. Uh, but uh, that was my personal view. And uh, they were a diverse group, and I mean diversity in uh, the very broadest sense, um, and whether it was or gender orientation or uh, gender itself or uh, ethnic background and political views. Uh, the I, I give you an example. There was a um, a seminar I went to uh, with a bunch of the fellows and a couple of scholars on MAID. Um, medical assistance in dying. And uh, actually, Rob Oliphant, uh, the parliamentary secretary, was uh, gave a talk, uh, although this was, he was in opposition at the time. And um, I I got a, uh, a, a real sense that there were people around the table who were all on all sides of this issue. And that's the way it should be. No, uh, I I take your point, and uh, graduate students are known to uh, to hold uh, strong views uh, one way or the other, as as you put it. But um, there's nothing wrong with that either, um, in terms of their their politics and and the like. Uh, can I also ask you, uh, Mr. Cap? Uh, we've seen this happen with other organizations before, where issues have become politicized to the point where they have led to the if not the outright end of an organization that's done good work, um, something very close to it, something approximating just that. Do you worry about the Trudeau Foundation um, ceasing its operations even? Or if not ceasing its operations, uh, being, uh, uh, being de debilitated in terms of its ability to, uh, to carry out its... Uh, the work that it's done in the past. Uh, I know that uh, the students that they have been uh, assisting certainly must look at all this with uh, enormous regret and, and worry. Is this uh, something that you would be concerned about and perhaps even caution um, parliamentarians to, uh, to tread carefully because there is responsibility here that extends well beyond politics and, and does impact the lives of, of students that uh, are set to do some extraordinary things? Uh, it's not my place to tell parliamentarians uh, how to do their job. However, let me do that anyway. Um, I think uh, this is a serious issue. Uh, I, I, I was not involved in the um, admission process to the fellowships uh, or scholarships, um, although I was involved in the admission process of Action Canada at one point, a couple of years. And what I worry about with the reputation that's being built now around the Trudeau Foundation, that they won't get the applications of the very best. It was very difficult for applicants to get uh, a Trudeau fellowship or scholarship. And I think that uh, it's a real danger that the standard will be lower because they will, the best will go elsewhere. Thank you very much. Turning now to Madame Sinclair Degagné, would you have parole pour? Ms. Sinclair Degagné, you have six minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for being here with us, Mr. Cap. I'd like to begin by correcting a point that may not have been very clear in your remarks. It was Ms. Rabillard. President of Treasury Board, supported by Mr. Goodale, had tabled the money for the Trudeau Foundation on March 19, 2002. That's when it was decided in the House and voted on. I'm curious to find out what you're talking about in 2004, a contract signed in 2004. Apparently, it was in 2002 that the foundation was officially created with the fund. If I understand correctly, and I'm not an expert, I don't have all the documents before me, but in March 2002, the government made a commitment to transfer the funds. But if I remember correctly, and I'm not certain, but I thought 
that the current agreement was signed in 2004. But I am no expert at this. All right. Can you tell me what role, in, in very few words, because I have very limited time, could you tell us about the role of the Privy Council when it was created in 2001? It was to help the Executive Council, the Cabinet, to make a decision. Perfect. To your knowledge, who took part in the lobbying to create this foundation? It was a secret, so I am not free to discuss it, but I forgot. I don't know, quite frankly. But I'm sure that there was consideration before a cabinet committee and then a decision confirmed by the whole cabinet. Okay, could you tell me more? Because these are interesting memory lapses, which unfortunately, it would be very useful for this committee if you could recall who was involved in the process of creating this foundation. It's been 21 years. So please excuse me for not remembering everything, but if I recall correctly, it was a process led by the Department of Canadian Heritage and then considered by the government, the cabinet, and confirmed by a cabinet committee. But it's possible that I'm confused between Canadian heritage and industry because at the last minute it was the Department of Industry that made the transfer to the foundation. Okay. When you were clerk of the Privy Council for many years, did you take part in the creation of other foundations like this? Not the creation of this type of foundation, but when we worked on the annual budgets, there was always the transfer of money to this kind of foundation, okay? Was there any other one that had a name clearly associated with a political party? No. Well, if you'll allow me, there was that kind of foundation in the name of the former Governor General, Adrian Clarkson. Okay, but not political, not affiliated with a political party. No, not at all. Okay, so not, a, not only is this a foundation affiliated with a party, but it's the only one with the name associated with a political party that received government money. I don't want to go there, but I could confirm there was a proposal tabled by Mr. Rock with support from the official opposition, the Canadian Alliance, that supported the donation of $125 million. In my archives, it says that the additional funds, the Bloc Québécois and other opposition parties voted against this uh, allocation of $125 million. So that contradicts what my colleague said, too. I have a quote from Mr. John Reynolds, who was the acting leader of the Canadian Alliance Party, and he supported it. The implication of Sasha Trudeau and the creation of this kind of recognition of a former prime minister. And there you have it. Thank you very much. Virtually as well, you have the floor for six minutes, please. Over to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much, Mr. Cap, for being present with us today. And 
I do want to just follow up on some of my uh, questions to some other witnesses in previous that I'm sure you might be familiar with. And it's just trying to find, you know, this kind of unique problem that Parliament is in and Canadians are in and albeit our electoral processes. And it's this perception that it's uh, been influenced in particular by example by the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation's connection with the Prime Minister and by way of a donation. And so that public perception, of course, I think, regardless of if it's of how true those things are, are out there. And I think when I joined colleagues in Parliament to vote for a public inquiry, it was to make sure, make more certain to Canadians that we take this seriously and that there be some kind of light shed on this. And I take your point that we need to hold the government and direct those questions to the government more appropriately. So I understand uh, your comments to that. But I think your opinion as well as uh, if someone to your esteem is also important to try to find ways to utilize this time to see what your thoughts might be in relation to a public inquiry, something that I'm uh, steadfast in trying to pursue and something that I think in the comments of Mr. Rosenberg is something that political parties will, of course, have to decide. But I also think that you as a member of the a Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation in its past and a high, you know, a high ranking civil servant. I think you take these issues seriously as well. And so understanding those things, do you think a public inquiry is important, especially as your previous service to, as a high ranking civil servant? And do you think it would have a benefit to Canadians to actually ensure that we spread some, you know, put some sunlight on this issue? Mr. Desjardins, I'm, uh, or Monsieur le Président, I'm um, very hesitant to go there. I'm here to talk about the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation, and you're asking me about your job, uh, whether to have a public inquiry. Um, let me make two points. Uh, the first is that um, I think the substantive issue of foreign influence is very, very important. And I commend Parliament for taking that seriously. Um, the second thing I would say is that it depends on what you mean by a public inquiry. As per the what, act, sir. Uh, well, uh, uh, part one of the part of the inquiries act creates inquiries, but doesn't say what they're to look at. Is it to be forward looking or backward looking? Is it going to be what happened and what did the government do? Or mm -hmm. is it how can we avoid this from ever happening again? I, I think a public inquiry is very important for the second question, the future. I think a public inquiry is inappropriate for looking backwards. And that's because I think the uh, leaker, he's not a whistleblower, he's a leaker, violated the law. And the Parliament of Canada should not be able to see the documents that uh, he leaked. And um, I, I'm afraid that uh, we, the Mr. Johnston said, members of the Privy Council should have access to it. And uh, I know uh, the leader of the opposition, for instance, is a member of the Privy Council. Uh, but uh, they, he offered or suggested that the other leaders have access to it. And I know Mr. Singh is uh, thinking about it. I, uh, I really don't think a public inquiry is helpful in looking backwards. You know, that's really helpful, Mr. Cap, and I do appreciate your expertise on this. And I think Canadians, I think it helps and serves us to understand the difference between what kind of public inquiry can do and those you, you mentioned the kinds of ways it can do that. In terms of a forward looking public inquiry, one that would look to seek uh, ways that we could recommend, for example, uh, processes or even laws that could stop or limit foreign interference in a way that's appropriate, particularly in our democratic systems, but also by way of fundraising, I think are important. Wouldn't you agree? Uh, yes, I would agree. The, my, my problem is what public means. Uh, and this is with the greatest respect, uh, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Desjardins, I suspect we mean different things by public. Um, uh, my notion of a public inquiry is not one that's going to disclose all the secrets of the public and uh, to the public. Um, and we have two examples which are actually quite successful of using part one of the Inquiries Act. One was uh, Justice O'Connor's uh, inquiry into Mahar Arar, mm -hmm. and the other uh, was uh, Justice Yakabuchi's uh, investigation into Al Maliki and three other uh, uh, alleged terrorists. And uh, they didn't disclose anything. That was public. Uh, that that would have viol would be would satisfy the interest that I think has been created for the public to have a voyeuristic look at uh, what went on. 
the, well, I the think that's like the independence is part of that important piece to it. I think the independence yeah. is what's in question with Mr. Johnston, for example, that uh, we've seen members of the opposition, of course, uh, attack that perspective. And I it's think independence is me, part sir. of it. It's no, not, not in question, question to me. Okay. So I'm not asking ahead. you that question, Mr. Cap. Um, with all due respect, I think your role here is to help answer our questions, not to try to find ways to inform us as to what is and what is or isn't our job, first of all. And so I'm asking, with all due respect, your advice as to what you believe a good public inquiry is, considering that you're a witness here today, but you've also made a statement that you don't want to look backwards, and you're part of that backwards-looking uh, review. And so I can I can sense, you know, your a private interest or a personal interest in trying to protect or uh, not do that. And so I, I do, I hear that point that you're making. Um, I didn't think it was necessary to be made. And so I do think that I, when I come back to this questioning in further rounds, I'd like to focus on what kind of importance a public inquiry has, but also the kind of perspectives that are important to that public inquiry, like independence. Thank you, Mr. Desjardins. You will have another opportunity. I appreciate it. Uh, turning now again, going back to, uh, for our second round to start, Mr. McCall, you have the floor for five minutes. Thanks, Mr. Kaplan. I just want to comment uh, and address something that you've stated, but we've heard repeatedly throughout this whole debacle with the Trudeau Foundation of various uh, promoters, almost propagandists, with blatant misinformation about the unanimously supported, we've heard, support from all parties for the development of this, and we just heard it uh, yourself today. I just want to quote from the Hansard, and this is 2001-2002, uh, Mr. Speaker, could the President of the Treasury Board, and this is from John Williams, MP John Williams, a um, United Alternative at the time, Mr. Speaker, could the President of the Treasury Board confirm that the bill is in its usual form for an appropriation bill and that the $125 million donation to the Pierre Trudeau Foundation and opposed by the opposition is actually in order? Further, the actual uh, journals show that every single non-liberal, non-NDP, which means the predecessors of the Conservatives and the Bloc all voted against the appropriation, and there wasn't a single vote from the opposition parties in transport, or sorry, industry committee when the estimates were being reviewed for this. So I'm not looking for a comment, but I do want to put it on record and put an end to the misinformation, misinformation and propaganda being put forward by very many people involved in the foundation that the opposition parties were in favor of this when clearly they were not. I want to go back to another comment you mentioned about a worry about the foundation not getting the best students because of the politicization. Are you familiar with who John McBain is? I know of him. I've never yeah. met him. Because I want to go back to your comment about not getting the best students. Do you think the uh, abhorrent handling of the sexual harassment lawsuit has anything to do with perhaps students not wishing to apply? And I bring this up because the lady who brought forward the um, charges or the, the suit against the Trudeau Foundation has been harassed. And in fact, John McBain, who I think was noted as the largest single donor, took her side separately at the behest of the foundation to try and bully her into or to uh, retracting her claims. Do you think maybe that has something to do with the best students not wanting to be involved in the I foundation? No I have no idea. Did you see any of this going on when you were a member? Because you were at the same St. John's conference as when these allegations were put forward? I did not see anything like that, no. Oh, okay, thank you. I want to get back to the foundation of the charitable, charitable status. Question, like we've seen, you know, the issue with the donations from uh, Communist China. We've seen that apparently they're not, the foundation is not following the obligations under the CNCA requirements as a soliciting corporation. I think it's eight years now. We've seen that they haven't been following their disbursement obligations. Do you think the foundation should be audited by the CRA? 
I, I really don't have a view on that. I mean, I, I assume that the foundation has independent auditors. Uh, any uh, Anything incorporated under the uh, Not-for-Profit Corporations Act would have to have uh, independent auditors, I assume. Enron and a lot of other companies have <laughs> independent auditors, but I get your point. Let me just ask, just want to go back to um, your time as a mentor. Was there any training given to the mentors around dealing with younger people, any sexual harassment training, any HR training around that, guidelines provided? Uh, there's certainly nothing on sexual harassment. Um, I, I mean, my God, it should go without need to remind anyone. But still, I, uh, there wasn't. But there was it a, a session. Hmm? It should go, but apparently it didn't go. Like, did you receive uh, anything? Because you're a man. You would be a not, person of. You'd be a, per, a mentor, person of power, prestige, and these young people are forced by the foundation to have a mentor. It's not an option. They right. have to have a mentor. Uh, I, so you would think the power differential is quite significant. So was there anything, any advice, any training that you had to go through, anything you had to sign off on before taking I a signed, mentor under your but wing? There was, or I don't recall signing anything. Uh, there was a session we had the day before uh, the first meeting we had with our mentors, or our mentees, rather. And um, we had a, a group of uh, former mentors and uh, us newbies uh, in a session where we talked about what worked and what didn't work. And I found that uh, quite useful. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. The bells uh, are ringing. I'm going to seek if there's uh, agreement to extend uh, just 15 minutes. Is that acceptable to everyone? Very good. Uh, turning now to Mr. Bradford, you have the floor for five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Mr. Cap, for, um, for being here as a witness today. Uh, we really do uh, respect your wealth of experience, and uh, so we appreciate you coming before us. Can you just uh, clarify for us uh, the time frame during which you were um, Clerk of the Privy Council? It was from uh, January of 1999 uh, through to June of 2002. Okay, great. So well before any of these uh, issues that we're discussing today came up. Yes. And, and um, what was the, uh, and did you have, so did you have much to do with the creation of the Trudeau Foundation? Well, as I said in my opening remarks, um, when uh, the Pierre Elliott Trudeau died, uh, there was uh, a couple of uh, people who wanted to do certain things in commemoration. And I had, all I did was make sure that there was going to be a structured and disciplined process to assess alternatives and come up with what the government wanted to, to achieve the government's objectives. And what was the purpose of the uh, founding of the foundation? Well, the, what I think sold the argument about creating scholarships, so I'm going to put the, your question about the foundation aside for just a sec, but the idea of doing it as scholarships was seemed to be a very apt commemoration of uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, the person, and, you know, his previous uh, law professor experience, et cetera. So, but then the foundation, I think, became a, con and again, I wasn't involved in that part of it. My guess is it became a convenient vehicle to do it. But it's achieved its mandate over the years? I've been very impressed with the quality of the people and the people who have been rejected from being admitted, who were very, very good. And the people who got in were even better. Okay, thank you. Now, we heard from Mr. Rosenberg that the foundation is entirely self-governed and that the rules were changed in 2013 to remove any role for the minister to name directors to the board. In fact, it's my understanding that the government of Canada has not appointed anyone to the foundation or its board in more than 20 years. Would you agree that that's the case? I have no idea. We also heard from Mr. Rosenberg that in 2014 and um, 2015, when the foundation was receiving the donation, almost everyone in Canada, including the previous Conservative government, was optimistically working with China to advance relationships. Would you agree that that was the general consensus during that time in Canada? 
Very much so. Um, I, when I was clerk, uh, the then Prime Minister Chrétien uh, would take almost an annual trip uh, to China with premiers and with business leaders. And uh, all of this was in aid of trying to promote uh, both investment in China and Chinese investment in Canada, but also trade. Okay, thank you. So you're listed as being a mentor for the Trudeau Foundation. Can you please elaborate um, what being a mentor means in terms of the foundation and its work? Um, the, the mentorship is vis-a-vis -vis an individual scholar. Uh, and so I mentioned that I had two uh, different scholars. Uh, one was early in his academic career. The other was already uh, an accomplished pediatric oncologist. He was still you know, in his early 30s. But um, uh, he was doing his research on uh, public health in Canada. Uh, and the other one was doing research on public health in uh, West Africa. And so their needs were different. And so my role was to uh, both give personal advice and professional advice. Uh, one of them, I won't say which, uh, had a challenge with uh, their uh, thesis supervisor, we discussed how to handle that, how to deal with it. Another one had family issues. We discussed that. Uh, so there, it really depended on the individual. So kind of a lot of problem solving and coaching, perhaps? Yes. Do you have any examples of the work of the foundation that it's done to improve Canada's post-secondary research or assist Canadian researchers in achieving their potential? Can you give us a couple of examples that stand out in your mind? I mentioned the uh, MADE uh, conference that I, a seminar that I was at. Um, in addition, I think there were uh, others uh, where researchers doing similar kinds of research or research in similar areas would get together and the foundation would bring them together. The other thing was that uh, the foundation had outreach as a, an objective and uh, uh, trying to both um, get the, the scholars used to dealing with decision makers and get decision makers used to relying on scholars, the scholarship. Et voilà, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Uh, turning out to encore une fois, Madame Sinclair. Ms. Sinclair de Gagné, please. You have two and a half minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Cap, who asks that the foundation bear the name of the former prime minister? I don't know. That was the objective to recognize the former Prime Minister. Did somebody ask that this foundation that would receive public money bear the name of a former Prime Minister? I'm sorry, I missed the beginning. Who specifically asked that this foundation bear that name? I don't know. In your experience, when you took part in the creation of a foundation like this, did it seem fair to you that certain criteria and commitments be made by this foundation that receive public funds? Should it respect certain commitments and criteria? Once again, I don't have an opinion on that. I see. As a former clerk of the Privy Council, you don't have an opinion on whether a foundation that gets public money should have certain commitments? They have a commitment according to the contribution agreement. And that's what we should insist upon in terms of performance. Okay, but in your experience, I understand that you were no longer clerk of the Privy Council when the contribution agreement was signed, but did you take part in similar things for other foundations? No, not to my recollection. However, would you feel that it's fair and appropriate that if criteria or commitments written into a funding agreement are not respected, a foundation could see its initial funding revoked? I don't know. That's a legal question, I imagine. Well, legal or rather equity and ethics, 
Yes. That's your job, madam. Yes, but I'm asking your opinion as a person who served for 20 or more years in the public domain. If there had been the theft, let's say, of this money or something completely against the objectives, yes, but frankly, all I saw was consistent with the objectives of the foundation. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Or again for two and a half minutes, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And Mr. Cap, I do want to refer to, to something you mentioned that I found to be interesting and a distinction that you made, which I also want to know why you think that distinction exists. You made a distinction between a leaker and a whistleblower in reference to your comments about the allegations of foreign interference and participation of that by the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation. That's a kind of evidence that I find to be quite interesting and a kind of perception and perspective that I think is very interesting. Why do you say that? A whistleblower is someone who sees illegal activity and uh, wants to make sure that it is dealt with. Uh, a leaker takes something that's a secret and releases it. Um, the, I mean, right now, if you're watching what's going on in the United States, uh, the president of the United States uh, is being indi has been indicted for uh, taking secrets away from secret facilities. Um, at least in his case, he keeps it in his bathroom. Uh, in the case of the leaker, he took it out into the public. Uh, that's illegal. I, I mean, imagine if. So you're uh, confident there's nothing illegal, even though you didn't serve there during the times of these allegations. I haven't you're... seen the document. I don't know what it is. Yeah, but I, you're confident that it's not something illegal. I read the article. And so by that judgment, you believe it's not illegal? I, I mean, I, I can be proven wrong. Well, then maybe a public inquiry could help you with that. Well, I don't assume that it's illegal. Well, I think the part that you have assumed, though, is that it is not illegal by making a reference to the fact that it's not a whistleblower. And so but, I'm saying, Mr. Cap, that's something that's not... That's a strange position to make when we don't lack when we lack the clarity of the truth here. And that's why I'm I believe, just like you, I think, that the truth is most important and should prevail here. That's agree. why I'm of the belief that a public inquiry is important. And we've spoken about that and something that members of the of the foundation have disagreed with. But I'm trying to get to the bottom of why they believe that. Sure. And you made a very interesting position that you believe it's nothing illegal is going on because well, if it was, if it was illegal. If it was illegal, uh, Bob Fife and Steve Chase deserve to have their uh, licenses to be journalists removed, which they don't have any anyway. But, I, I mean, if they found something illegal, they should have written about it. But if, the only thing they found illegal was that this individual released secrets that are illegal to release. Imagine if the journalist had written, we're not releasing the identity of the uh, source, because the pedophile uh, would be subject to a prosecution under the criminal code. You wouldn't accept that. And thank you very much on that. Thank I Mr. suspect Cap. we'll come back to this. Uh, turning now to Mr. Cram for the last five minutes, and we'll go off to vote. You have the floor, sir, for five. Uh, okay, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you to Mr. Cap for joining us today. Um, Let's uh, rewind the clock to 2002. What, what I find so uh, interesting about this particular organization is that the, the initial grant was not for a specific project. This was for an endowment that would exist in perpetuity. Um, are you aware of any uh, precedent for, for the federal government creating such an endowment? Uh, you mentioned the, the Governor's General uh, earlier in the meeting. Um, again, uh, the, those were uh, similar in some respects, in the sense that there was an endowment created for the Canadian uh, citizenship uh, Institute, I think it was called, uh, that uh, was created as uh, uh, when Adrian Clarkson stepped down as Governor General. Um, there were also a number of other, and you know, my my memory fails me here, but there we got into a parliamentary dispute uh, because the Governor General didn't like the government giving out money at the end of the year, and you may recall that. Uh, when there was money left over at the end of the year, uh, the government would look around and pay down debt. Uh, but every now and then it would take a lump sum and give it to 
uh, an institution. I forget what examples there were. I should have looked it up before I came to you today. But uh, the, that was a, a dispute where the governor, the auditor general, I forget what I said, the auditor general disputed that the government should be able to give that money away at year end spending. Okay, so let's take, you mentioned Adrian Clarkson and her institute. Um, are, are directors from that institute uh, appointed by Adrian Clarkson's family, uh, to your knowledge? Uh, that is my knowledge. Yeah, uh, that, sorry, that is, to the best of my knowledge, the case. That, that it, there was an institution created and then it perpetuates itself. Oh, oh, okay, so... With that, uh, with Adrian Clarkson's institution or, or the Trudeau Foundation, were when these institutions were being set up, was there any concern ever raised about the governance structure, about having one particular family appoint directors in perpetuity? Not that I'm aware of. I mean, it was, it, it, again, go back to the... I was involved in uh, the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer. I was on the board. I was vice chair for five of six years on the board. And that was created um, uh, by the Harper government. And uh, there was one board member who was appointed by the government. And the rest were all appointed by the members. And the board itself would take off the hat of board member and be a member of the uh, institution. Now, um, on the, the Public Accounts Committee, we uh, deal with uh, reports from the Auditor General on a regular basis. Mr. Kim, I'm actually going to pause it right there. Okay. I, I, I agreed to 15 minutes, and while you're, you have two minutes left, I think I'll just pause it there. Just I, I, uh, I, I, sh I should have said I'll, th I'll hear three more speakers, but I said 15 minutes, and, and we're, at, at, we're at that time. So I'm going to cut you off there so you, do, you have two full minutes when we, when we return. Um, uh, Mr. Cap, if you wouldn't mind just bearing with us, we'll come back to you. I hope within uh, within 30 minutes. Uh, I think there's just a single vote, so I'm going to suspend this meeting. Yes, Mr. Dejale, do you have a, a point you'd like to raise? Yes, I, I, with unanimous consent, maybe we can just allow just two minutes to finish for Mr. Well, Cram. Well, uh, I'll look to see if I have it, but I I had agreed to 15. Well, well, I have a guest coming to dinner in uh, in one hour. <laughs> Very good. All right. Well, what are we having, Mr. Cap? What are we having? Yes, yeah, send send it up. <laughs> I will suspend sure. this meeting. We'll see you back here as soon Not as possible. Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Cap, for for staying with us. Um, so here on the Public Accounts Committee, we review Auditor General's reports all the time, and it's a, a very useful function of government for uh, parliamentarians to be able to make recommendations to improve the functions of government. But uh, there, there does seem to be a, a breakdown in accountability when we have a, a, an organization such as the Trudeau Foundation receiving a $100 million grant and then... Uh, you know, basically being told uh, good luck to you. So in, in your opinion, would it be in the public's interest if the Auditor General were able to audit uh, entities such as the Trudeau Foundation and uh, provide a greater level of accountability to, to Parliament and to the public? Uh, this is one of the uh, issues I wanted to raise, Mr. Chair. So uh, in response to Mr. Cram, let me uh, say no. Um, this isn't something that I think uh, would benefit from that, but let me explain why. Um, the uh, when I, I was uh, president of the en répondant à Madame Sinclair de Gagné, il m'a manqué quelque chose. No, I was asked something that I should have answered. Uh, president of the Institute for Research on Public Policy after I left the government in Montreal. Um, the IRPP was created in, in the government of Pierre Elliott Trudeau. Uh, he created a little um, uh, inquiry, if you will, but it wasn't a public inquiry. But it was um, a, a piece that came up with a report, a task force, that said there should be a, an institute for research on public policy, like the Brookings Institution. And IRPP was created. And IRPP was given $10 million by the government at the day. And I said to Madame uh, uh, Sinclair de Gagné that I couldn't remember any other kind of institution, and yet I was the president of one of them. So I feel guilty about that. But uh, the fact was that we were an institution that was created by government. There's another one, and again, I was involved with, although it doesn't have the money from the government, 
Uh, and I've been drinking from the uh, Canadian Blood Services uh, cup that I uh, have been using. I was the chair of the board of Canadian Blood Services for four years. And it was created, as we unfortunately can recall, after the tainted blood scandal. Uh, it didn't get money from uh, the, uh, the federal government except to do research, but it got money from provincial governments. But there was an obligation to have an independent auditor. I go back, Mr. Dejala was emphasizing independence. Uh, it is an independent auditor, but it isn't the auditor general. Th so okay. that's my answer, Very Mr. Good. Krim. Thank you, Mr. Cap. Appreciate that. Um, turning now to Mr. Sidhu, you have the floor for five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks to our witness for being here today. Uh, Mr. Cap, uh, you, you said you had wanted to clarify something or finish off a uh, previous uh, remarks. Uh, you got cut off if you want to finish now. Um, well, it was actually, uh, again, for Madame uh, Sinclair de Gagné, uh, there would have been a process. Il y avait un processus devant le. There was a process before. Treasury Board that was uh, dealing with contributions. Uh, uh, back to Mr. Dejolet. Uh, I'm, I'm the one, curiously, defending Parliament here. I'm telling you that Parliament has created legislation which has to be respected, and that is the Security of Information Act. And I, I want to make sure that no public servant takes it upon themselves to make a judgment that they know better than Parliament. That's my point. Thank you, Mr. Sidhu. Thank you, uh, Mr. Cap. And uh, you mentioned uh, public servants. It's National Public Service Week, so I want to take a moment to thank you uh, for your service to Canadians and, and all of our public servants. Um, uh, Mr. Cap, with your wealth of experience uh, in, in the Canadian public service, uh, I want to know if you had any advice uh, uh, you would provide to parliamentarians regarding how best uh, to protect elections and Canadians from foreign interference, uh, especially uh, in your previous roles? Uh, I'm tempted to say if I did know, I wouldn't tell you. I'd create a company to do it. Um, I, that, that's a big question, and I don't really have a simple answer. However, um, I do think this is a fundamentally important question about the future of democracy, and in particular, democracy in Canada. So I, and And that's why... Uh, if there's a disagreement, and I don't think there is between me and Mr. Desjolais, it's really over this point about being forward-looking. And I think it's important for Parliament, and I don't know, I think it's probably the Procedures Committee or um, uh, Public Accounts or Ethics, uh, where uh, you're all looking at the Trudeau Foundation, and I would hope that you're looking at uh, how to protect uh, the integrity of our elections. Fundamentally important. Thank you for that uh, that information. And uh, Mr. Cap, you had uh, proudly mentioned uh, that you mentored uh, two PhD uh, graduates. Uh, um, I really want to hear more in terms of your belief in the work of the foundation and why it's important for Canadian researchers. So uh, when it was created, um, Mr. Rock, as the responsible minister, characterized it as anal analogous to the Canadian roads. Uh, scholarship. Um, I don't think it's gotten to that level yet. Um, on the other hand, it is a big whack of money. Uh, and it allows students to, the PhD students, to do research that they wouldn't otherwise be funded for. I mean, let's put this in context. The granting councils like NSERC, uh, SHRC, and uh, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, uh, CIHR, um, do a lot of funding, and, and they are very well endowed to do a lot of funding. Not well endowed enough, I, in my current capacity, I would say. Uh, but I, I, right now, I, I just bumped into a former teaching assistant of mine yesterday who's doing a, a SHRC grant uh, where he got $5 million to do research on this question of polarization and the integrity of elections. So relevant to this, uh, to Mr. Sidhu, your, your questions, we need to have that money coming from the granting councils. It is incredibly valuable to have independent uh, funding uh, that comes from other sources. And these foundations, and whether it's uh, the Ivy Foundation or the McConnell Foundation, 
um, uh, or the Kanoff Foundation, there are many. Uh, these are great sources for promoting independent research by very good Canadians. Mr. Chair, how much time do I have left? About 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Uh, so really, really quickly, uh, we've heard from previous witnesses at this committee uh, about the foundation and its important work. Uh, uh, many of them firmly believe that the, the foundation is completely nonpartisan. Is that something that you also believe that it's uh, completely Very much so. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'll just thank the witness once again for his time today. Thank you. All right, thank you. So I'm, I, I have some informal agreement. I'm going to try to, 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 uh, to direct things. Um, if anyone disagrees, they're welcome to um, seek clarification. Uh, Mr. McCall, you have the floor. I understand you want to give your time to the Bloc colleague. Mr. Cram. No, I'm going to come back to you, Mr. Cram. I do have that. Um, uh, Madame St. Claude Degagne, you have the floor for five minutes, please. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur McCauley. Uh, toutes les fondations que vous, avez, vous venez de nommer, là, Monsieur Cap, euh, la fondation McConnell, euh, évidemment, il y en a beaucoup d'autres, la fondation euh, Marcel et Jean Coutu, la fondation Molson. Toutes ces fondations, just, vous l'avez dit, ont un rôle in, important. In, in par... Now, can you hear the interpretation? Yes. So, all of the foundations that have already been mentioned. Thank you. So the various foundations like McConnell, Molson, Jean Coutu are named after individuals, but the Trudeau Foundation didn't get any money from the uh, Trudeau Foundation. It's public money that was provided, taxpayer money, that went to a foundation named after a former prime minister. Maybe the objectives are noble, but the foundation is different in a major way. So I also want to follow up about the public policy research institute, the RPP. Why does that uh, institute have the role it does uh, with uh, with relatively little money and the uh, and why didn't the money go to a foundation that already existed well the foundation has a different purpose the idea was to recognize the contribution of a former prime minister, so it was natural to include his name. But if the family wanted to recognize his work, why didn't the family create the foundation with its own money rather than putting mon public money into a pub private foundation? I don't think that the request came from the family, but uh, rather from the, the uh, from the public. But the family has played a big role, including uh, the son and so on. So the public has been called on to put the money in there, and. So for me, there's something a little bit uncomfortable about that. The first cha board chair was involved in the process and probably created the governance structure. Who was that? I'm sorry. Roy Heenan, who was one of the partners in the Heenan Blakey law firm, and he was the first chair. So he was one of the people who lobbied to ha have the foundation created? I don't know. I knew him at that time, but I don't know if he was involved in the creation. Well, when I asked you who pressured the government to create the foundation, uh, you said that you didn't remember. No, it was Prime Minister Chrétien who launched the process to create the foundation in recognition of the contribution of the former Prime Minister Trudeau. So, okay, those... 
Now, I don't know if you have seen in the papers that the Trudeau Foundation has broken certain laws, uh, for example, uh, the uh, with Revenue Canada, and the foundation has to follow rules to keep its charitable status. If we look at the last five years, four of those years were ones in which the foundation did not uh, comply with the rules under Revenue Canada to maintain its charitable status. If we look back at the origins of the foundation, the political affiliation of the foundation, can we not say that there has been favorable uh, favoritism in the treatment, preferential treatment? I don't have any knowledge of what you are talking about, but the chair or CEO who uh, I know that we have obligations under the uh, charities legislation, and we met those obligations. Well, you fulfilled those obligations, but are you surprised that over the past five years it has not met those obligations for of those years? Thank you. Thank you very much. You have the floor for five minutes, please. Thank you very much for coming and spending your time, your valuable time on, on this topic, especially when uh, it doesn't appear that you, you are so involved. Thank you. Um, so based on your experience in public policy and governance, especially governance, do you have any opinions or recommendations you would like to share regarding next steps for the foundation? That's a tough one. Uh, uh, again, I'm not involved. I haven't been involved in the foundation since 2018. Uh, given the controversy that uh, is going now, I think the foundation, ha it is a worthwhile organization. It's doing very good work. I hope that it gets over this uh, controversy in a way that allows it to reman its, uh, reman is a not appropriate word, uh, restore its uh, membership of its uh, both members and uh, me uh, members of the board and the mentors and the next round of uh, scholars. I think it does very good work, and I hope that uh, that can happen. I, I I recall when I was at IRPP and the foundation, we, we were around the corner from each other, our offices. Uh, the, the problem uh, when I was at IRPP, was that uh, as someone said, uh, the foundation has the wrong uh, the foundation has the wrong name uh, because at the time it was a conservative government and it was called the Trudeau Foundation. Uh, and then after the election of 2015, somebody said to me, "Oh, the Tru the Trudeau Foundation has the wrong name." Uh, and it seems to me like you can never have the right name if you're the Trudeau Foundation. I think it has to get over that uh, problem uh, of uh, having the wrong name, if you will. Uh, going along the theme of the the name, um, could you imagine the foundation without the name Trudeau? And do you think that there would be any controversy around donations or any allegations of foreign interference? Uh, let me not address the last point. Um, uh, but uh, on the first point, I think... Uh, it, again, I come back, uh, as I said to Madame Sinclair de Gagné, the, the objective was to, rec uh, was to provide reconnaissance uh, uh, to, to recognize the, um, uh, prime, the former prime minister, Prime Minister Trudeau, and, Pair, uh, and that uh, if you're going to be the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation, if that's why you're doing it, to recognize his contribution, I think it has to have his name on it. Um, in your opening statement, you mentioned that 
um, a group was thinking of a way to honor the prime minister. And um, do you recall what ideas were discussed? Um, there no, were all it's a long time ideas. ago. <laughs> it was a very long time ago. Yes. I only remember a couple, but uh, my my objective as secretary to cabinet and clerk of the Privy Council was to uh, not allow them to dream up ideas at the table at the moment, but rather have a what I characterized as a structured and disciplined discussion and an assessment of the alternatives. But there was everything from renaming a mountain to uh, the, you know, Mount Trudeau or uh, creating a highway or, you know, I mean, there were just a whole range of other things. And I think the uh, cabinet finally settled on it because, and I'm probably disclosing cabinet secrets here, although it's after 20 years, the um, they came to this judgment because they thought it was apt to have a scholarship named in uh, former Prime Minister Trudeau's name. So um, you talk about how you were responsible for the structure. What do you mean by uh, the structure? No, I, I just mean the decision-making process. Okay. Um, so um, several experts in foreign interference and members of the foundation have stated that the idea that a donation to the foundation could be considered as a calculated influence operation. Um, I, I, some, I wonder about that and um, just wondering, would you agree with this analysis? I would. Um, I, I, I find it passing strange. If I had a million dollars uh, to spend on influence, giving uh, 800,000 to the Université de Montréal and 200,000 or 140,000, whatever it is, to the Trudeau Foundation would be so indirect to make it ineffective. Uh, there are- Th Thank you very much. Know, oh, yeah, there you go. thank you very much. All right, um, this time again, guiding along, um, Mr. Desjardins, you are gonna be taking the Blux two and a half minutes plus your two and a half minutes for five minutes. You have the floor, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and Mr. Cap. I do very much appreciate your uh, frankness today, and I'm certain that maybe there was some cabinet confidence breach from 20 years ago, and I'd hope that you would help us to understand even more, I think, than what we've been having to present. So I want to return now to the issue of perception, which I think is the really the largest issue that I talk to community members with, and it's something I talk to Canadians regularly about. And I attempt to try to find a balance between what I believe to be hyper-partisanship, but also the truth. I do think that there is some happy medium in there to which Canadians can find a balance between what is the criticism of partisanship, but also the real reality that you've also agreed to, which is that foreign interference is in fact true and it's happening. And every witness we've had in this committee has verified that fact. Uh, and uh, so I, I want to now return to, I just finished questioning you about CSIS, for example, the whistleblower or the leaker, for example, of, um, you know, in your perspective, whichever it is. But I also, I think it highlights how these issues are up for perception. You know, your perception of this issue is something different than I've heard from Canadians and someone down the street. They all have a mix of issues. So to restore confidence in our democratic institutions, you've answered some really incredible uh, questions about the nature of a public inquiry. There's, you know, the nature of that public inquiry, from my own learning, at least, at least and with your expertise as a civil servant for so long, looking at a backward-looking public inquiry, a forward-looking public inquiry, and the question of whether or not some of these details should be released. You gave two really good examples of some justices that have administered public inquiries for the better uh, outcome of Canadians, but also found to have concealed important documents of national security uh, or, or, or privacy concerns of private entities. Should the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation, for example, undergo a public inquiry that would, let's say, conceal all private and uh, private documents for the purpose of privacy, at least to that end, would it be, you think, at least in your own private opinion, of value to Canadians to at least have a recommendation to what you've just stated as those donations having little or no influence? So three quick points. Uh, first of all, I thought you were talking about a, an inquiry into the general point about foreign influence of which the Pierre Elliott Trudeau. Oh, sorry, Mr. Cap. Yes, apart. I do. Okay. I am. But I think that the Trudeau Foundation and many other foundations, for example, at least as they pertain to private donations yep. towards a kind of influence 
matter. Yeah, and this uh, look, doesn't just the Trudeau Foundation. I should make I should make mention. Right, and and frankly, it's not uh, uh, the allegations in terms of Mr. Hong and Mr. Chan in Ontario and all of that. Uh, I, I think that's an interesting question. I would b make it looking forward. I think it can be done. Uh, I that uh, respected the secrecy, but I think now this issue has become so fraught and so emotional in the public's mind that I don't think if you did it the way those three commissions were done, mm -hmm. it would satisfy the demand for publicness. That's my problem, okay? Uh, the, the only other thing, if I may, is uh, I remembered Dick Fadden when he was the director of CSIS uh, doing an interview, remarkably, with Peter Mansbridge for uh, about four, 35 minutes. Uh, on, and I went and looked it up. And if you just Google Dick Fadden, uh, Peter Mansbridge, you'll see it there. And at the end of it, Mansbridge, uh, the former anchor at CBC, yeah. says I'm young, to him, but I'm not that young. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, I got the gray beard. But, <laughs> but the, point, the point was that uh, uh, Fadden did disclose that there were several provincial cabinet ministers that were, he thought, uh, alleged that were the subject of uh, foreign interference. This is not a new issue. The, I was surprised to see, I thought it was more recent, it was 13 years ago that that interview took place. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm very much of the view that Parliament, either in its own committees or through a public inquiry, uh, should look at what we should be doing about, uh, about this. And I, I really don't care what was done. That's, that's I guess, where we may have a minor difference. Oh, no, of course, Mr. Kaplan, I do appreciate that, that differentiation. And I think it's also important to take into account, this isn't just China. You know, we're talking about mul you know, multiple countries, in particular Russia. You know, we're seeing some severe interference there. And something that's been pretty absent, I think, from the relative conversation of foreign interference. Would you agree that if there is to be a public inquiry, that it should be expanded, you know, looking at other countries, and maybe even all countries, foreign interference in Canada? I would make it about foreign interference. I, I, I mean, American infer interference? Thank uh, you very I, much. That is your time. Um, turning now to our last, we just have two last spots. Mr. Cram, you have up to five minutes. Please, over to you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr. Cap, for, for being here today. I, I just want to follow up on an earlier question. Um, I just want to make sure I understood you correctly. Did you say that a donation of $170,000 to the Trudeau Foundation would not be enough to buy influence with, uh, with the government? I said that if I had 140000 or 200000 or a million, I wouldn't spend it that way if I was trying to exercise influence. That's, I, I think it's an inefficient way of doing it, and they're not stupid. What do you think would be a more efficient way to, to buy influence? Um, a more traditional way of uh, taking people uh, out for coffee and dinner and uh, putting, uh, giving them um, a refrigerator and a stove and uh, maybe a car. Uh, I, I mean, I don't get make me into a, a terrorist or a, a spy, but the but I think there there are more efficient ways of doing it. I, well, in, in response to Mr. Dejale, if I, if I would have had the time, I would have said, this is not new. Go back to 1945, the Guzenko in, uh, inquiry. Oh, okay, with, with all, all due respect, Mr. Kapp, I, I am almost out of time, but you have to go for a lot of lunches and a lot of coffee to get up to $170,000, you would have to agree. My point exactly, sir. Okay, but uh, do you know what the, the contribution limits are to for donating to a political campaign in this country? I think it's about two thousand dollars, something like that. It's slightly slightly less, and so is it really that difficult to imagine that if an agent of the communist regime in Beijing wanted to buy influence with a political candidate, and found out that the contribution limits were seventeen hundred dollars, is it that unreasonable to think that the, the that agent might go to Google and look at you know what other entities in this country have the same name as the current prime minister and try and buy influence that way? Um, uh, no, it's not unreasonable, but I would, if I were doing it, I'd, I'd go 
for the expatriate community. I would I would get a whole bunch of expats to pay seventeen hundred dollars to put somebody in my pocket. Okay, well, that's. Uh, are you aware that that is what has uh, been alleged with the case of uh, Mr. Dong? I, I do understand that, and that makes a lot more sense to me. Okay. Now, you did say earlier that uh, you know the the substantive issue of foreign interference is a very very important issue, and your concerns were echoed on on Monday's meeting by by Mr. Rosenberg, who said that anyone who has family left behind in an authoritarian state will be vulnerable. What? Uh, what public policy options are at the disposal of politicians to, to you know, limit or eliminate this uh, foreign interference? Because it is a legitimate concern and a serious one if you have people living and working here in Canada who are obeying all of Canada's laws but, are, but whose family members are being intimidated back home in, in their home countries. Well, what public policy options could you recommend to address the issue? Yeah, I, I, look, I haven't studied this carefully enough to really recommend policy options, but I do think there's issues of finance, there's issues of the expatriate community, and I agree it goes to Iran and others, other countries, Russia. Uh, and so I would, I would really look at not just finance, I would look at all the other ways of influence. I mean, we saw the Confucius uh, Institutes uh, for what they are. We've seen how universities, my university, has withdrawn from uh, doing research on um, uh, uh, funded by China. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Cap. I believe my time is pretty much... Uh, okay, so uh, I, I see the chair indicates I do have an extra minute. So if... Uh, uh, but when, when it comes to... Okay, how, how do I want to say it? So if someone breaks Canadian laws... In Canada, that person is punished under Canadian laws. But if a person's family members are being intimidated back home, you know, we've heard stories of, uh, you know, someone makes a, a a social media post in this country that is critical of foreign regimes, and then the next day that that individual's family members get a knock on the door and told that they better, uh, you know, shut up their family member or there'll be trouble. What what public policy options? do we really have at our disposal as Canadian policymakers? Well, uh, unfortunately, you only have jurisdiction in Canada, but that's pretty broad, and it gives you the capacity to lean on uh, people who would otherwise uh, be engaging in activity even abroad. You can't uh, make that an offence of what they do abroad, but if what they do in Canada uh, is offensive, then... Uh, you can go after them. Uh, I don't know how... Thank you very much, work. Mr. Cap. I'm going to have to cut you off. I do want to get yeah. you off to your dinner guests. The last uh, question is for Ms. Shannon. You have up to five minutes, please. Well, thank you very much, Chair. And I, too, would like to thank uh, the witness for appearing before us today uh, and, uh, and being very generous with his experience and uh, expertise uh, in this uh, matter. Uh, Mr. Cap, you mentioned um, uh, several other uh, uh, organizations, or institutes, uh, foundations that were created uh, during your time, on or about uh, your time, uh, by the federal government. Um, can you talk to us about the usual governance uh, practices uh, around uh, the creation and then the ongoing monitoring of, of um, say, for example, uh, the um, foundation, that uh, Canadian Citizenship Foundation that was for... Um, uh, Adrian Clarkson's, um, uh, to honor, I guess, a Adrian Clarkson's work, uh, as well as the, uh, the, the Trudeau Foundation. Um, for example, why not have the Auditor General um, auditing these um, organizations? Well, uh, again, uh, it means that uh, should the Auditor General be auditing the um, uh, the five pin bowling association because it gets a grant from the government as well i think the answer is no and uh but you should and i i agree with the principle you should insist that there is an independent auditor and and there is because the law requires it so uh, i i just think if the example i had of irpp for instance I was uh, president of the, there was a $10 million grant originally. We 
had taken it up to about 42 million by the time I was president. But um, and we were living off the uh, interest of that. We had an audit committee. The chair of the audit committee was a member of the board, and it was the former governor of the Bank of Canada. And uh, and then we had an independent auditor who happened to be Grant Thornton. And I think we changed it in my time and and just for the interest of keeping it fresh, went to another one of the big uh, audit firms. So I think that's the way to make sure it happens. Well, thank you for that, because I think you have uh, seen some of the previous uh, testimony in this uh, committee, um, if not just to just to um, review it, uh, having to do with the um, receipt and deposit of uh, this donation that was by an incorporated entity uh, registered in Quebec, uh, um, may or may not have been in foreign funds. I, you know, I, uh, I'm not going to get into all the details, but certainly there were questions around this deposit. And of course, subsequently, with the re recent uh, media attention, the um, uh, the uh, foundation trying to return the money and what that meant. Uh, you know, having been a, a banker in my former life, I know that uh, you know these things are not not cut and dried, and um, and not everybody has um, uh, that kind of uh, you know accounting uh, attention to detail. Uh, but uh, would you have been concerned about um, uh, the auditors, the independent auditors in in uh, at the Trudeau Foundation, like just not doing? their job properly or the indeed the accounting firm that would have prepared the uh, the, the, the financial statements um, no uh, I wouldn't have been worried if it was an accredited auditor uh, and then and respected the uh, public sector audit uh, boards rules and regulations uh, and and I think that's where you have to come back to I had this curiosity I will now disclose something I shouldn't but the governor of the former governor of the bank that I mentioned was Gordon Thiessen and he was also the chair of the uh, public sector audit board and so the auditor was subject to him as well as him ensuring that the, he ensuring that the auditor was doing their job well it, it, indeed uh... The uh, Canada Revenue Agency uh, was uh, officials were called uh, before us as well, and uh, members here uh, were very insistent that the officials uh, uh, reveal whether they, or not they were doing an audit. And uh, there's been uh, uh, many attempts to obtain the uh, actual. Um, confidential uh, tax information uh, that uh, CRA would normally hold. Um, do you have any concerns about this? Uh, I mean, should the CRA just be providing this kind of uh, documentation? Um, I think it should be respecting the privacy of the uh, of the audited person, uh, Personne Morale, uh, the corporation. I think that uh, uh, you have to have confidence that either uh, CRA is doing its job or not. Uh, I think it's doing its job. I mean, I have no information other than I have confidence that it does its job. And judging by how it treats me, I know it does its job. <laughs> very good. Thank you very much. That is the time. Uh, distinguished fellow Mel Cap, I want to thank you for your patience with us today. I hope your dinner guests aren't, uh, you haven't stood them up too, too long. Um, I'm going to suspend this meeting so we can go into camera. Mr. Cap, you are excused. And again, the committee thanks you for your time. We'll Thank resume you, very quickly. Good luck.